And on today's podcast, we'll be chatting about becoming a physical therapist. I'm going to do my very best to pronounce the surname of this uh, lady. A very welcome to the podcast, Cheryl Iloff, or Iloff. Is it boat? Mm-hmm. Is that correct, Cheryl? Did I get them right? You got them right. Excellent job. I couldn't cool. have done it better myself. Thank you. A plus. Wonderful. So I gave an introduction about yourself uh, just before the podcast started. I know we chatted before the podcast briefly. So can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself? But before then, where are you right mm-hmm. now on planet Earth? Right now, I am right in the very center of the United States. I live in Denver, Colorado, uh, the Mile High City, right at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. It's absolutely beautiful here. It is hot, but uh, I think it's hot everywhere right about now. Um, But yeah, I've lived here, it's been 44 years, if you can believe that. I'm originally from a small steel town in western Pennsylvania, and um, grew up there. And once I finished college, I just wanted to go out and see a little bit more of the world. And since I am a skier, or I was a downhill skier, I figured Colorado sounds pretty good. And one of my college roommates, um, she didn't want to stay in Pittsburgh. She was originally from Cleveland. She didn't want to go back there. And I says, well, why don't you come with me? Let's just go to Denver. And she said, okay. So we (laughs) packed my 1974 little Ford Maverick. And the two of us drove out to Colorado together. And we're both still here, as a matter of fact. It's been a long time. So how warm is it at the moment in Fahrenheit? I th- I spoke to you before the podcast, re- we started recording, and I said in Ireland at the moment, it's very, very hot. So are we talking 80s, 90s in Fahrenheit? We're, talk- we're talking 90s right, right about now. And um, we've had a very long stretch of 90s and even high 90s, so much so that once uh, about a week ago, we dropped down to the high 80s and everyone was going, oh, boy, it feels so cool. <laughs> And is it humid? No, it is no. not humid. That's the nice thing about Colorado is our humidity is very, very low, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time, um, because it, it gets so dry sometimes, you know, your skin just is craving a little bit of humidity. Um, but it's it's kind of like a desert type of climate here. It's right. kind of hard to believe, even though in the winter we do, of course, get quite a bit of snow. Um, however, the snow melts pretty darn quickly here in Colorado, except oh, okay. in the mountains. Oh, all right. Mm-hmm. And and do you mean do you get much skiing in every year? I mean, you're a, you're a skier, so what? I've never been skiing before in my life. So what what is that like? <laughs> oh, skiing for me um, is like dancing on the snow. Oh, now okay. I stopped skiing about. Oh my goodness. When I turned 50 in my early fifties, I stopped skiing and it wasn't because I didn't have the ability anymore. I mean, I was still healthy and, you know, my knees could still handle it. I just got tired of how crowded the slopes were. They were so crowded. It was so expensive and it was getting incredibly dangerous because there were so many people on the slopes who did not know what they were doing and did not take (laughs) lessons. So it's like, you know what? I value my life um, a lot more than I value skiing. So quit skiing and so did my husband. Um, And we do a little bit of what we call winter hiking, which probably sounds crazy to the normal person. But we'll just go up into the mountains and hike in the snow. It's much more quiet and less crowded and a lot safer than having to, you know, all these flying bodies down the hill at um, (laughs) breakneck speed. (laughs) I'm so jealous, I have to say. I've never done it before, but a lot of my friends are saying it's uh, it's a pretty cool, especially, they always say it's the best holiday they've ever had, um, doing a skiing holiday. But um, yeah, no, but... Very exciting stuff. So tell us then, so your journey to becoming a physical therapist, I mean, when did all this start? Was this a passion from a young age? Did, you know, you mentioned your college years and stuff like that. So when did it all begin, this passion or this love? Or is it still a love? Well, off and on, on, (laughs) a love affair. But uh, (laughs) it actually started pretty late in life. You know, when I went to college um, for my undergraduate degree, I was actually um, getting my bachelor's degree in something called respiratory therapy. Um, Sometimes they call it cardiopulmonary sciences. Um, You know, it's a a cardiopulmonary specialist. So we really specialize in the respiratory system, the lungs, the heart, the circulation. Uh, And it was very intense because there was a lot of critical care work that went along with it. 
Um, you know, you're working with patients on ventilators in the ICUs, you know, post-op cardiac care unit, pediatric intensive care, even the neonatal ICU, it was the emergency room. We were part of the resuscitation team. It was very intense. And I had no idea what I was getting into <laughs> when I started this program. But, you know, I'm the third daughter. Um, out of five girls, my parents and my father was an immigrant. My mother was born in the United States, but she was the daughter of immigrants. And of course, I'm a baby boomer. So when we were growing up, especially my two older sisters and myself, my mom had the three of us in four years. So it was like, boom, boom, boom. She has these three little girls. And so she really wanted us to go to college you know, to get an education. And my father was thinking, hey, they're girls, they're going to get married, they don't need to go to college. So my mother convinced him. And he finally saw the light and his rationale was so funny, because he says, yeah, just in case they marry jerks, but that's not the word he used. You know, they'll still have something to fall back on, you know, in case they marry idiots, you know, they could make a, a living on their own. So that launched my mother into what are my girls going to do? So the only quote unquote, feminine professions that she knew about was nursing and teaching. And so that's what she wanted us to do, because then once we got our education, got married, had our families, then we could still work part time. So that was her rationale. So ironically enough, my oldest sister got her bachelor degree in teaching, and she is still teaching. She's a teacher. My second sister, older sister, got her degree in something called medical technology. So it was more lab um, type of work. And uh, that sister and I were close in age, just about 14 months apart. And I did everything that she did. So I followed in her footsteps you know, everything she did, I did a year later. And she came home from college one time and she told my mom, she said, you know, Cheryl's not smart enough to do this program. It's too hard. <laughs> All right. That's a good sister. <laughs> uh, yeah. She was really looking out for me. And then she said, uh, but there's this new profession called respiratory therapy. And maybe she could do that because it's an easier program. So that's how I ended up in this program to become a respiratory therapist. And I'm here to tell you, it was not an easy program. It was really difficult. It was just as difficult and challenging as med tech. And I had no idea what I was going to be doing once I got out of college. So it was a real shock because the first two years um, at the college, uh, you know, it was a small state school in the middle of Pennsylvania. And we were doing all the prerequisites. And I hated school all my life. But it was my second year in college. It was like, hey, wait a minute. This stuff is interesting. I'm learning about anatomy physiology. And I discovered I loved the biological sciences, the physical thi sciences, chemistry, physics, not so much, but I, enough to get by. So my third year in college, all of the students who were in our program for respiratory therapy, who made it this far, were sent down to this enormous teaching hospital in the middle of Pittsburgh. So there were only 20 of us, and we all went down and we were doing our last two years of college was doing more of the didactic work and doing the clinical training at the same time. So that's where we were getting our clinical experience. And it was brutal, but I realized that I loved the cardiopulmonary sciences so much. I loved being able to help people. It was hard because I was seeing things that I think that no 19, 20 year old should really see without a little bit of preparation, but I really loved helping people and I, I did love what I was doing. And after I moved out to Colorado and met my husband at work, he was a respiratory therapist as well. So I was doing this career for 17 years until I finally hit the wall and realized I wanted something different. And because I was a dancer, and because I was really into skiing and I had studied a lot of Pilates, I thought, you know, physical therapy would be a perfect, perfect fit for me. And so I started looking into what it would take to become a physical therapist. And that's how it all began. Wow. <laughs> You've had a journey. So, okay. So it all began and let's get to the nitty gritty. Okay. College wise, or even training, to be a physical physical therapist in, in, in the States, what cost are we talking about and the length of time does it take to study to be fully qualified? Roughly, so roughly, it's yeah. 
Okay, so it has changed quite a bit since I was in school. So uh, the cost as well as the level of training. Um, when Before I, I became um, interested in, in PT, the, the training was a four-year education, just like I did for respiratory therapy. So it's very similar to that. By the time I was interested and started looking into physical therapy, it was, um, it was a master's program. So you had to have a four-year degree. It didn't necessarily have to be biologically related or a biology type of degree, but it helped. Um, so you had to have a, a degree, and then you had to take more prerequisites. So go back to school to take the prerequisites that the, the school wanted you to take or the schools, you know, because you have to try. You can't just apply to one school. It's a very competitive field. So I had to do the prerequisites, which took me about three years to do more prereqs, and then apply to the school. And if I got accepted, it would be a two-year program. Now they actually require a doctorate for physical therapy. So it's a three-year program of being in a doctorate program for PT. So the cost has gone up considerably. Right. Um, when, when I went through the program, and, you know, that was when I started, when did I get, 1994 to 1996. So I'm kind of dating myself, but that's okay. I'm pretty Don't proud worry. of my age. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and so at, at that time, actually the tuition, just the tuition itself was only about $18,000, which is really an inexpensive when you think this is a master's degree. Yeah. I had to take out a student loan because, of course, I would not be working at all. You just can't work like, you know, and do the program at the same time. This was a full-time job in itself. So I did have to take out a student loan, which was significantly more than that because I had to help pay for, you know, the books and, um, you know, the, the household expenses as well too. But considering how much I spent on it and considering what they charge today, the difference is just incredible. And the qualification you have in the USA Say, for example, you want to, say, work in Europe or you wanted to work in Asia or the Middle East. Can you transfer that qualification or do you have to do more training to meet the approvals of the local regulations, if you know what I'm trying to get at? I do. And I'm really not sure because I never explored that or looked into that for myself, but I would think that you would have to go, go through some kind of qualification program. Even if you are fully qualified in the United States, you know, we do have um, a license. So you have to have your physical therapy license as well as your education. So I'm, I don't know, I would imagine that it would um, vary from, you know, country to country. Uh, and I know in the United States, we have a lot of like traveling nurses that come from other countries into the United States. So they have to go through some sort of qualification um, program or whatever to be, you know, to make sure that they were competent in their field. So I would imagine there would be the same thing for physical therapists. And I would think that the role of a physical therapist too would vary from country to country as well. So in relation to the role then, so what, what's a typical day for 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 a physical therapist in your world <laughs> well in my my world is a whole lot different because i have my own practice and i do my own thing um so i took myself out of the traditional realm of physical therapy for a variety of different reasons but the nice thing about physical therapy is you can work in such a variety of different settings you know you can specialize in so many different techniques you know it could be manual therapy it could be um, pediatrics it could be home health it could be women's health. It could be geriatric. It could be neurological. It could be private practice. It could be in a um, clinic, a busy clinic. It could be in um, acute care hospital. There's so many different areas. And if you get tired of one specialty, you can always go and do another one. Of course, all of this requires something called continuing education. So you do have to stay up with your CEUs, your continuing educations to be able to stay in practice. Right. What then? So let's take it back a little step. So you've 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 been doing so much training over the years. So what subjects did you need in school, kind of to our high school to prepare you to carry out this role? It's like kind of like I mean, do, do the uh, say the, the the companies or the educators or the colleges do they look at specific subjects to make it more easier for somebody like yourself? Say you're starting off again. Uh, as an entrant into college? I mean, what, what are they looking for? And what should you focus on in school? 
Well, if I were, you know, right from the very beginning thinking, this is what I'm going to do with my career. This is what I want to do. And keep in mind, there's always a possibility that you can get on this path to become a physical therapist and do all the work and do all the right things and never get accepted into a school. So that okay. is reality and you have to know that. So if you are preparing for something like this, you have to understand that that is a possibility. So there might be other fields um, that you can go into where a strong background would be applicable. So you wouldn't be just wasting your time and say, hey, now I want to go get my degree in business. Right. So if you truly have a love or, and an interest in doing it, I would focus on the biological sciences. You might find out that you don't like it. Or you might find that it really just speaks to you, which is what I found, but I didn't even realize that until after I was starting my college um, program. I have to admit, I hated school all my life, which is really <laughs> ironic <laughs> that I ended up getting a master's degree, right? You're like um, me. <laughs> I, I, I hate school. hated school. Uh, the biggest uh, dulcer, just, biggest messer. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. It's just like, oh, you know, let me go outside and play in the snow or do That's something it. fun. I don't want to sit here and do this stuff. But when it got to, you know, th those are things that I was really interested in. And I didn't even find out how much I loved that until I was in my respiratory therapy program and I was learning advanced pulmonary um, physiology. And it was like, oh, this stuff is so cool. So I would definitely, if you're thinking about going into the field, start taking some of those biological sciences, uh, some classes, and do take some of the physical science classes as well. I mean, those are really brutal for someone like myself. I didn't like it, but I had to take them. So I had to figure out a way, not only to get through the class, but to get good grades because physical therapy is so, so competitive that if you don't have a very high, you know, GPA, a very high score on what they called your um, GSAT, which is your graduate um, entrance exam type of things. And if you don't have stellar recommendations from people in the field, you know, your chances are you're not going to get in. Wow. That, that's a reality I wasn't expecting to hear. So it is that tough. I mean, why are they be? Why is it so competitive? Is it just that they just want to have a high standard of of applicants? Is that what you're talking about? A high standard of training, or is that is that why? It's just it's a it's a field that really appeals to a lot of people, and people right. really you know want to get into physical therapy. Um, so there are so many applicants and so many people that maybe even like for example, there are some people who want to get into medical school, and then they think, oh my gosh, I don't want to do all those years of training. You know, maybe physical therapy would suit me a little bit better. So that type of thing. But even in my case, when I applied to physical therapy school, the very first time I did not get in. And I had 17 years experience as a respiratory therapist in critical care. I had been a supervisor. Um, I had been an instructor. Um, I, and I had a 4.0 GPA and right. I had a wow. pretty good, uh, score on my, my GSAT. It wasn't stellar, but it was good. And I had some wonderful references from, you know, from colleagues and even physicians who recommended me and I still didn't get in. I didn't even get an interview. Right. Wow. Okay. So yeah, so it is tough, but don't give up mm -hmm. if you're listening no, to this, don't, don't give up. Keep on doing. You never give up. Never give never up. Never give I was, up. I was going to make a comment there, Cheryl. I think the reason why you look so young is because right. you didn't take school too seriously. Like myself, that's it. Mm -hmm. We didn't take it serious, so we we wait until later on to get a bit serious. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I ask then? So you mentioned there that for a variety of reasons you didn't possibly go the traditional route of physical therapy. And I can see your eyebrows are going up. There. So <laughs> can you be as blunt as possible, if you can be blunt as possible, you don't have to mention organizations or whatever, but mm -hmm. why didn't you go down the kind of traditional route of employment oh, rather than mm -hmm. have your own practice? Tell it to us straight. Oh, I will. I'm a straight shooter. And David, you're going to love this. Okay. Yeah. I just know you are. So once I finally get into physical therapy school, the second time that I had applied and I'm going through this program, which was absolutely grueling. And when I got out and I graduated and I got into the workforce and I started working as a traditional physical therapist, guess what happened? Okay. Okay. Couldn't get a job. <laughs> no, I got a work. job. That, there wasn't enough. There was the, enough work out there. There was was there not enough work out there. 
Well, basically, yeah, I absolutely hated what I was doing. The um, job market for physical therapy in that the time frame when I graduated, they were going through an incredible um, change. There were way too many therapists, not enough jobs. We were going through a lot of insurance changes with the insurance companies and, and stuff. So, you know, a lot of jobs were getting cut and the only jobs available were subpar, let's just say that. And, right. you know, I hated what I was doing and it was just gut-wrenchingly grueling and not what I had wanted to do. I thought that once I became a PT, maybe I would work with dancers and help them through their injuries and help them, you know, have healthy careers, that type of thing. But I was working in nursing homes that were really a low quality. And another thing that happened too, especially since the insurance was changing, that the focus of PT was changing from patient care to productivity. Right. Uh, okay. Money, so, money, 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 money. There yeah. you go. Makes the world go round, money. right? So can I ask then, just, just a quick before before you continue, just I'm, I'm writing down little notes here. So in that situation, do the colleges, because you see all this marketing, I'm not just going to point out at physical therapy or medical or nursing mm -hmm. or whatever, even in aviation, for example, it's all about, mm -hmm. you know, trying to be this, trying to be that, mm -hmm. earn 60,000 a year, X, you know, mm -hmm. job for life. Why, why, well, we'll cause, probably answer my own stupid question there. Obviously, it's a business at the end of the day, and they want to promote that these industries are these jobs. But do the, has the industry changed in any way to kind of say, look, as you mentioned already, it's quite competitive. Um, the likelihood of you getting a job might be 10%. I don't know statistically what is the opportunity of getting a job. And then, as you mentioned, if you do get a job, you might like it. Because mm -hmm. it's productivity, you're kind of like, let's rush the patients through as quick as possible. Next mm -hmm. is a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. So how does that, I mean, is there any information out there now to actually tell the truth? Or is that against the rules? Uh, I, I don't <laughs> know. And I have been, uh, that's a really, that's an awesome question, actually. And, you know, I, I have talked to a few uh, new students, you know, who had graduated recently. One actually um, is a woman, a young lady that I was taking ballet class with. And when she was going through the same program I went through, and of course it had changed. It had been 20 plus years since I had graduated. So it was a much different situation, different curriculum, different professors, thank goodness. Um, and it was a much different situation for her, although, you know, it was grueling and she couldn't wait to get out, blah, blah, blah. And when she did graduate, she did get a job and it was a fairly good paying job, but she was loaded down with so much, um, you know, student debt that she was working a little bit extra to try and, you know, pay that off. Well, I just found out recently that she landed a job um, in New York, in Manhattan, to be the physical therapist for the staff of a Broadway show. Oh, wow. Okay. So bless her heart. She is living the dream. I mean, and she's she you know, has a dance background herself, and now she's traveling with them. I saw a post where she was in North Carolina traveling with with the team, or, you know, the crew. And so yeah, so you can have a really, really great career and a great experience, but you you have to keep an open mind and you have to be willing to work your butt off. So what she had done was even after graduation, she took some specialty courses, which there you go. More time, money, more school. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she got a certification, a specialty certification, I think, in orthopedics. Um, so that set her up. But again, you've got to be willing to really work and work hard to get those type of certifications and specialties. She, she doesn't, like, when, with the Broadway actors, she doesn't tell them to break a leg before they go on stage, do they? Just so she... <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. That's a, Sorry that's about a good that. question. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, the old saying, break a leg. They're probably like, what? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow in my in my office for physical yeah, therapy. Right. Um, what about then, so what's an average do you think now? I mean, there's so many different, you see advertisements again, and they're saying, oh, you get 50 grand, 60 grand, 70 grand, 40 grand, I don't know. What do you think, in your own opinion, is the average salary now working for the traditional kind of physical therapy? Wow. That would be so hard for me to say. You know, I can just make a, a, a stab at it or a yeah. guess. A disclaimer, um, I, it's a stab. For anybody listening yes, to this, it's a stab, yes. okay? <laughs> Personal disclaimer here. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> I am guessing um, 
at, I, I'm guessing that maybe a starting salary would be about 40 grand. And I, I think that was, I'm low balling it. So I'm thinking it'd probably be about 40 grand entry the level. US and dollars. I think, yeah, US dollars. Right. And cause, uh, yeah, that's the only thing I know are US dollars. Right. And it could go up to um, 120, maybe even more, depending on where you're working, what your credentials are, and what people are willing to pay you. Right. And just for a rough idea, because obviously the tax rate in Ireland or in Europe, generally, depending on what country you're in, even a certain place of Asia, well, Middle East is not much tax. But anyway, what type of tax are we talking about in the States or is it depending on each state that you're in? So for 40 grand salary, just say, for example, it was 40,000. So for mm -hmm. 40 grand salary, could you survive on that? I'm trying to give a reality here to people because we all believe in the American dream. We all believe going abroad here, there and everywhere. And we go, oh, yeah, Canada wants us, America wants us. Great. And we're going to get 50 grand, 40 grand. Can you survive where you live in 40 grand a year minus your tax and having to live not, not, not really a special life, but just a general an apartment, maybe a mortgage, a car? Could you? No. No. OK. No. So what, what, what would no. you need to live a normal life where you are at the moment? Roughly. Not, not in physical therapy, but just generally. You know, that's really, really hard for me to say because um, our taxes have gone up uh, exponentially even over the past like few years. We just got a notice that, you know, our, our property insurance, our, pers our personal uh, property, no taxes, not insurance, have just skyrocketed to, you know, it's, it's, I can't even tell you how much more it's gone up. I, right. They've more than doubled. Um, so you're, and it does vary state to state. So you right. want to, Check out the state that you're Check going to. Check out the states. That's it. <laughs> you need to know where you're heading. Yes. Because some states, um, they have no personal in income tax. Okay. So they have no state income tax. Where, you know, we all have a federal income tax. We all have to pay that. But in Colorado, of course, we have to pay a state income tax, which is quite high. Right. But there are some states like, uh, I can just name two off the top of my head, um, Florida, yeah. South Dakota, and there are a couple of others where they have no no state income tax. They right. make all of their um, their revenue through like you know maybe some a low sales tax and that type of thing. But they manage their budgets really well and they they do quite well. So it depends on where you go. Um, you know, New York has an incredibly high high um, income tax, state taxes. Um, uh, sales taxes, tax, 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 they are really taxed to death. And so is California. And now so is Colorado. So, so what percentage, you know, Cheryl, are we talking about? So say, say, say it is 40 grand, okay, for a year's salary. How much tax or state tax would that would be? 10%, 15%, 7%? How, how does it work that way? Or a federal tax? Oh, boy, you know, I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not even sure. And, and I don't want to say, because I don't want to say something that's really outrageous since this is going to be, you know, um, global, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> global. Um, I am going to, and because it does, you know, right now, I mean, our taxes are going up again, so yeah. it, 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 it varies quite a bit, but I will tell you this with a very high level of confidence. Yeah. Um, once the taxes go up, they usually don't go down. Oh, okay, they stay there. Yeah, they pretty much right. stay there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's it's uh, no, I mean, I, I love America. I've I have mm -hmm. family living there, and mm. what we do, we you, you, we get kind of trapped into that kind of marketing dream of come come here and you'll have a, a great time. But then again, if it's not worth it, what why would you? I don't know. It's it's all preference, I suppose, and people's perception, what they think they want to do, and, and that's that's themselves. Okay, so let's move on then with regards to. What is the most enjoyable part of the job? And you mentioned earlier on that you, you were seeing things that you shouldn't have seen earlier on. So what's the worst part? And not about ingrown toenails and stuff like that, but I mean, generally, <laughs> generally, or warts, but I mean, be, be as gory as you possibly can. But what is the best and the worst? So we'll start with, let's, let's start with the worst because then we can end with a positive, so to speak. So okay. what's the worst? what's the worst things? Okay, so now I'm going back to when I was working as a traditional therapist because yeah. my life right now and what I do is like so completely different. It's night and day. So um, the things that probably shocked the heck out of me um, when I was working as a traditional physical therapist, and this was really funny because 
of course, when I was I was working in subacute care, you know, um, long term care, subacute care, subacute rehab, and uh, oftentimes the facilities that I was working in would have a respiratory therapist there too. So of course we would have some bonding moments together. And I remember, I have to be honest, it would be wound care. Wound care was the worst part of the job, and even some of the horrible things I saw as a respiratory therapist, I could not believe that I was doing wound care cleaning out wounds that were infected, oh. purulent, um, you know, and I would have to clean it. I would have to debride it. Oh, my word. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, if it's, I had this one job that we would do wound care rounds every Monday morning. So I'd have to go through the whole facility with this team, which included nursing staff and a lot of other people, and of course, PT. And all I could think of as we were doing these wounds and looking at everybody's wounds on Monday morning, it's like, I should be in ballet class right now. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of my favorite ballet classes on Monday mornings with my ballet master, who I loved so much. And it was like, and I'm doing this? Where did I go wrong? How did this happen? And I would always have the respiratory therapist would come up to me and say, I don't know how you're doing this. I couldn't do it. And I'm like, yeah. And ironically enough, before I opened my own practice, I did go back to respiratory therapy because I was recruited by a local um, community college who um, wanted me to come and teach for right. their respiratory therapy program. And I said, wait a minute, you don't understand. I haven't done any respiratory therapy for you know six years. And they said, oh, we don't care. We're not going to put you in the intensive care units. And I thought, well, that's good. <laughs> um, they said, we're just going to give you our beginning students and put you on the general floor because you're so good at what you do. And you know, you can teach compassion as well as um, you know, the, the techniques and all that stuff too. So I said, well, sure, because I really hate what I'm doing and I wasn't really working full time in, in PT. So I was actually teaching respiratory therapy to these, these students and I was making more money right. as a teacher for respiratory therapy than I was for physical therapy. And it's like, once again, where have I gone wrong? And I loved teaching. I did not love getting up at 4.30 in the morning and being at the hospital, you know, before 6 a.m., but I love teaching. And so that was during that time, that transition, that I got that mental head smacking moment of, <laughs> hey, guess what? You don't have to do this. You can go out on your own. And that's why I did it. So I'm going to be negative again. I am Cheryl. Sorry about this because I want to. I want to hear the gory stuff. So, in regards to wounds, where's the worst part to have a wound? And my second question is, did you ever hurl and throw up, kind of <laughs> near the wound, or did you go, oh, oh, okay, there, there comes my burrito. It's time, it's time, to, it's time to run to the nearest toilet or bucket. I mean, where's the worst part? I mean, are we talking about legs here? Are we talking about stomach, back, shoulder? Where, where would somebody have? Where's the worst area to get a wound, actually? Where would be the most life-threatening, would you, would you we, I would say uh, your buttocks, because, you know, of sitting, and we sit so much, and that's typically what happens in people who are not mobile, who cannot, you know, get up and move around, and they're sitting in their wheelchairs, or they're sitting in chairs, and so they're not able to shift their weight and move, so what happens is you don't get the blood flow to the area, you know, that you're supposed to get. So even as you're trying to heal the wound, you know, and you're doing all of these techniques to help the wound heal. And of course the patient is on multiple antibiotics, medication, uh, orally, systemically, and you're cleaning the site and you're doing everything. And you're also, we would do, um, like uh, positioning for them and create special pillows to take the pressure off and, you know, getting them lying down in different positions just to try and allow for the blood flow to come back. But that's probably the worst part, but legs, feet, um, <laughs> you know, feet are really bad. So right. if anybody, um, is pre-diabetic, you might want to change your diet and, you know, because that we would see a lot of diabetic ulcerations as well. And those were very difficult to heal. So to be as blunt as possible, you see a lot of butts in your job. <laughs> well, not in my job now. None the butts that I see are actually, previously. you know, right. yes. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah, that was really tough. And that's why the one, one woman, uh, respiratory therapist who came in one time when I was, um, cleaning, and debriding a, um, let's just call it a, a sacral wound. We'll clean, yeah, we'll use right. the correct term, sacral wound, a wound. So she just looked at me and she says, 
I got to get out of here. I don't know how you're able to do this. And I thought, you know, you can get used to anything. And no, I never did hurl. Mm -hmm. um, there were times when I was just like, I can't believe I'm doing this. And, yeah. you know, what happened to that young girl who thought she was going to do something really pretty or lovely or beautiful, like <laughs> Celeste Lauder, you know, or something like that. And I never imagined I would be doing something like that. So that's, uh, yeah, it was kind of crazy. It was really crazy. And how, how then did the patients react? I mean, obviously you do it because you have a certain love for it, but do you ever get, this is going to sound a bit of a pun now, do you ever get the typical pain in the ass? patients <laughs> so to speak i mean <laughs> here you are kind of doing your stuff you're trying to help this person yeah do you ever get yeah. the annoying ones i don't mean now because obviously this is your business so they're all really nice but i mean the, the ones previously did you ever get like the annoying go on tell us go on. they don't have to tell me who they are but did, yes, are there any ones who are like oh god i just wish this wouldn't heal you're annoying yeah. me so much <laughs> Okay, so the first thing I have to comment on is we really need to work on your sense of humor. I think you really need to get a, a sense of humor. Okay, so. okay, it's really okay. bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, no, and that, that's my sarcasm coming okay. out. So I just, you know, and what you're doing is, you know, one of the things you learn as a medical professional when you are in those types of situation is a sense of humor. You laugh at some of the most inappropriate things. Of course, you do it when you're back in the office with your coworkers, with yeah. your colleagues. And that is the way that you get through some of the things that you get to, because it's just so you're, you're seeing such a gritty part of life. Yeah. And then, of course, you're projecting, oh, my gosh, this could be my mother. This could be my sister. This could be, you know, uh, someone I really love or this can be my worst enemy. And you still have to treat them all the same way. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we there are some people <laughs> um, that were so rude and so difficult to deal with and you just have to get that inner peace going um <laughs> you know don't worry it's okay you paste that big old smile on your face and when you get home you just relax have a glass of wine just clear the you know the slate and um do it again the next day so generally just don't take anything personal so kind of yeah. have a, a dark moment to yourself have a joke in your mind be sarcastic that's a way of kind of coping with mm -hmm. with with this type of uh daily um enjoyment i don't know i don't think i could do it cheryl to be honest with you i think i think generally i would probably unfortunately I haven't got much of a filter so i would probably be cleaning the wound <laughs> i would probably clean the wound cheryl and telling them what i think of them while i'm doing it <laughs> because i just i would like oh why am i here and um, okay oh. let's, let's move on to the let's move on to the uh, the business side of things generally so you're you're i can see behind you you have the reluctant ninja so yes. what is the reluctant reluctant ninja are you the ninja what is it so let, let's let's i've obviously looked at the background side of this but let, let the listeners know what it's all about Okay. Yes. I am a ninja. And I like to say this is my ninja disguise. You know, every ninja has to have a disguise because they're hiding in plain sight all around us. So the book is, um, it chronicles my journey into the strange new world of men and martial arts when I began training in an ancient Japanese martial art called Nimpo Taijutsu, the art of the ninja. And I began my training at the tender young age of 47, and I did not go willingly. So there is a big, <laughs> long story behind it of how I began training and why I began training. And, you know, it, it's so funny because the universe, God, you know, the, the great mother, whomever, whatever deity or whatever you believe in, sometimes just is there to put all of the pieces back together for you. And that's basically what happened um, for, for me. Um, I had had a traumatic experience. And just a few months after that experience, I was recommended uh, this acupuncturist, a new acupuncturist. And I thought, okay, well, you know, he sounds okay. And this was a client who recommended him. And she was really picky. So I knew that, you know, the guy had to be good. Otherwise, this woman wouldn't be going to him herself. So I went to this acupuncturist for the very first time. And... He had this little clinic right next to this little martial arts school. And the first time he put needles in my legs, he got a very far away look on his face. And he said, you know, with your legs and my coaching, I could teach you how to kill with these things. All right, okay. <laughs> 
And and have you killed yet? No? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet, but okay. I, Not yet. <laughs> but all I could think of was, who thinks like this? What normal person thinks this way, let alone says it out loud? So right. I thanked him and I says, you know, no, I'll, I'll save my killer legs for ballet class. We're good. Long backstory. It took him three years. That man was like a dog with a bone, would not stop nagging me to start training with him and he kept telling me he's this good it would help me get my power back it would help me heal from the trauma and i'm like i don't understand how hanging around a smelly dojo with a bunch of sweaty men is going to make me feel any better <laughs> well finally um i finally he broke me he finally you know wore me down and i said okay i'm going to take a few classes just to prove to you how much i'm going to hate it and then i'll quit and and 10 years later, I became his first female black belt. Wow. So you're you're like that movie now. Are you like, not, you're not really the reluctant ninja, but are you, I mean, with the sword and all that type of stuff, are you kind of like a, a danger? I mean, are you, wow. <laughs> well, I would never hurt you. Let me put it no. to you this way, because not I yet, just adore you. <laughs> well, you are too far away. Yeah, but don't uh, no never underestimate the, the energy and the, you know can go across the ocean of of a, a good ninja. So no, you know, but and the but, you, but you're a ninja. You're you're ninja. you're a ninja. Wow. Yeah. And you know, it's really funny because when Mark, who's my sensei, that's his name, Mark. And Hi, when he was, <laughs> and everybody loves Mark and everybody who reads the book, oh, we just love Mark. And I'm like, hello, star of the show here. You know, what about me? So, but, um, you know, he, he's just, and I, that just got me off, off track, but anyhow, um, Oh, he used to talk about the ninja and he'd say, yeah, we're ninjas. And I would just, I'm just laying on the table, right? You know, pinned because I kept going to him for acupuncturist because, uh, or acupuncture. He was really good at what he did, even though I, I was sick of him talking about his art of the ninja. And, you know, I'm <laughs> laying there pinned to the table as he would go on and on and on talking about the art of the ninja. And he'd say, well, we're ninjas. And I was thinking, how old are we? <laughs> you know, you're calling yourself a ninja, you're a grown man, you know, and I, I just couldn't believe it. And then once I got into the dojo and started taking classes and oh, I, I can't even describe the sensation and the feeling of what it's like. And I'm telling you, David, most of the time I was the only woman in class. So that was really hard for me going from this, you know, aging, middle-aged ballet dancer to a room full of Neanderthals whose goal it was, was to beat me up, take me down, choke me, pin me. And, you know, yeah, it, it was really kind of crazy, but they were so wonderful. And it was so much fun. And there's such a, I want to say a seduction quality of the art that it kind of just sucked me in. And once I got used to the guys, because there, it was kind of different. And they got used to me <laughs> because they never met a woman like me in the dojo. They never had a woman who would excuse herself to go fix her makeup or put on more lipstick. And it's like, we're fighting here. You know, you're supposed to be, let me attack you. Um, but once we got used to each other and learned how to communicate, they were amazing at teaching me how to tap into my feminine energy and my feminine spirit. Yes. And to really access the spirit of a warrior that I know is in each and every one of us. That's amazing. I mean, I God help the person who tries to burgle your home, especially mm. when they see those knives or these uh, swords <laughs> behind you. I'd be like, you'd be like, whoa. Okay. So, I mean, do you wear the full outfit? I mean, do you do you practice still? Do you still? I mean, are they heavy to hold those swords? I mean, I can see them behind you there, especially behind the book. But are they quite right. heavy? You know, the ones that I have really aren't that heavy. So there's a certain technique in picking out a sword, um, which, of course, I didn't know anything about when I got my first sword. Um, it was one of those serendipitous things. Another one of those, oh, the universe planted it right in front of me and said, go for it. My husband and I were in this small town in the mountains. And we had just gone to lunch and we were walking around through the little shops and stuff. And I saw this knife shop. And I said, oh, Michael. I need to go in here. Oh and he God. said, Cheryl, it's a knife shop. Yes. And I said, I know. <laughs> and that's why I want to go in. And he's like, okay. You know, he, poor man had to get used to, you know, this ninja change in his, you know, little ballerina wife. So we walk into this <laughs> knife store 
And I specifically walked in because I have two knives that my father made. You know, he was a steel worker and, um, you know, a bricklayer, mason. He was just an amazing man, also a skier. And, you know, they, my, he had passed away recently before, you know, this happened. So I had these two knives that he made and I says, I want to see if maybe, you know, they can sharpen them up or I just want to see what's what. So I walk in there and I looked as I was talking to the man and behind him were these swords. And I said, are those katanas? And he said, yes. And I said, may I see them please? And of course he gives me the look, you know, yes. like, <laughs> yeah, and you see the word bubble above his head. Oh, isn't she adorable? <laughs> you know, she wants the sword. So he he took down like one or two or three of the swords for me. And I and everybody in the store is looking at me and kind of giggling and smirking. And I held the one and I didn't even unsheath it. And then I held the other one and I held the third one and it was like oh, magic. It felt like in my hands, it just felt so like it belonged there. So I unsheathed the sword kind of cleared out the store everybody backed off but and I started moving it around and it just felt so good in my hand it felt light enough that I could you know use it it wasn't overpowering me but heavy enough that it had enough weight that it would really be effective so you know I said I want this this is my sword and it's really funny because um, once I got it home and looked at it a little bit more closely, the Suba, which is the handle, you know, a lot of them have special designs or whatever. It had a dragon on it. And something else, too. But I looked at it. It was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I grew up in an um, Eastern European family. I grew up in the Eastern European, uh, like Catholicism, it was like Byzantine Catholic is what it's called. And the church that I grew up in was called St. George. And St. George was, um, it was the, not the dragon slayer, it was the, oh gosh, victory bearer. Right. And George is also my father's name. Oh, wow. So there's something in common there. Okay. Yes. Yes. So it was yes. like, I think it was my father that said, go into this store. So basically he found the sword for me. So that was wow. my first sword. Pretty and cool. Are, on, are they expensive? Yeah. Are they expensive to buy? Well, if you get the real Japanese katana, yeah, you can, you know, they start probably at about $1,200 American dollars, but these weren't that expensive. They were just a couple of hundred dollars and, you know, they're just my, my toys and things that I can practice with and play with. And I just love having them. And it's, you know, it's part of my story and part of who I am. That's brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm sure um, we know who controls remote control in your household. It's obviously... My husband, uh... <laughs> not me, yeah. not me. <laughs> You know, he's so funny. Once once I started training and started climbing up in the ranks and getting good, um, people would always say to him, well, are you nervous about this? And he would always say with great confidence, oh, I can still outrun her. Well, then his knees started to go bad. So when he was getting got bad arthritis in both knees and he was just starting to be, you know, like really cautious. So now he got both knees replaced. So he still he can still outrun me. All right, good. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's, he's delighted. <laughs> he's so happy to hear that. So I'll be very nosy, Cheryl. I'm on your, uh, your website, uh, CherylInLove.com, and uh, so can you tell the listeners? So what services do you provide? I know it has workshops, Vitality Zone, complimentary cons consultations. You have media, books. You have a blog. You have events. You have everything. So generally, do you do any consultations via uh, Zoom, or is it all in house? Yeah, oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. I do consultations via Zoom. I also work with people via Zoom. Um, I closed my physical practice um, in 2017. It was a confluence of events just kind of came all together. And it's like, you know what? I need a break. I need to step back. I had already published my first book. I was thinking about doing the second one. And I started to launch like um, a career in the direction of being a public speaker, which I have done a few. And then COVID hit. Um, but anyway, I just, I closed my practice and then I relaunched it online, um, just about a year, a little bit over a year ago. So I do work with people online. I do still work with people in person, um, as consultation or teaching workshops. I just taught a workshop up in the mountains a couple of weeks ago, and I do teach a weekly movement class for a dance studio near me. Oh, pretty cool. So you can do both corporate, individual or groups. So absolutely. Yep. 
nothing's out of bounds. And I'm just being nosy again. So you, you have a complimentary consultation. It says uh, for 30 minutes. So how does that work? They just they, somebody get in touch with you. They send you an email. And you... Yep, send send me an email. Uh, you can do it through my website or just if you're listening to this, it is info at CherylILove.com. And remember, I love, there's no E on the end. Um, everybody does it out of habit. Um, so just send me an email, <laughs> say you'd like a consultation. And then I will set up, we'll set up a Zoom time. I'll send you a link to my calendar. We can set up a time and um, yeah, you can ask me anything. And where can you get your books? Are the books generally from your website only or can you buy them elsewhere? No, you can get them on Amazon and, you know, all of the other online bookstores there and all of the other ones. But the best way is just to go through Amazon because it's really fast and quick. Um, so I've got my two books, The Ninja and that one. It's it's really it's a, it's a roller coaster ride. So it will take you through, um, you know, that first experience of trying martial arts and, you know, the up and down. And it's it's really it's really, it's a great story. You know, sometimes I go, wow, I wish I would have been that lady. Oh, it is. It's me. It is you. No, yeah. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, why, I mean, have you plastered all of this all over social media? I mean, have you, have you told the world that you're a ninja? Because I mean, we, without, with all due respect, it's me being sarcastic again. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's women posting stuff lately, which is in comparison to what you've done is i'm sorry ladies it's pretty pretty weak but i mean <laughs> i'm not i'm not dissing what you've done whoever you are but some of the stuff you see you're like oh come on i mean um, i brought my cat for a walk or what well, come on guys let's let's get real i mean yeah. have you you've told the world about this have you and what reaction have you gotten I am telling the world. Um, it was it, it was hard because there's a lot of personal stuff in the book, and yeah. once it went out, you know, I was so excited to have it published, and then it was like, <gasps> you can't get the genie back in the bottle. It's out there. Everybody knows my story, and I would walk around like for a couple of weeks, like, oh my god, I feel naked. But right. you know, I got over it. Um, but oh, let me see. So what was oh the question is go back to what was the original question? Generally, what it was is that we see a lot of stuff. And social oh, media yeah. that's trying to empower women and promote women and i'm all in favor of that but what you've done is is a lot of dedication a lot of training mm -hmm. a lot of commitment mm -hmm. you've actually done something out of out of the box which you mentioned already is yeah. generally male orientated um mm -hmm. people should know this because i think you're an inspiration to get more Thank women you. involved in this Thank you know what I mean? You. So it's, it's, um, so that's what I'm trying to get at. I mean, yeah. When well, you, when to you me, plaster it all over social media, really <laughs> throw it out there, get that picture up there behind you in your book, honestly. Well, to, to me, this is empowerment on an organic and visceral level. Um, you know, some of the empowerment things that I see online are, you know, if you stand with your hands on your hips like this, it's going to raise your testosterone level and you'll feel powerful. And it's like, well, okay, that's great. What's yeah. going to happen though, when somebody attacks you from behind, you know, are you going to yeah. say, hang on a minute, I'm going to do this, get my testosterone up because I'm telling you ladies, I don't care how much testosterone you have. We have got to face the facts that there are people in the world, typically men who yes. are just bigger and stronger than us. Yes. And personally, you're not going to be able to outpower them. I cannot outpower a cat. I'm not that big of a person. You know, I'm five foot seven, 120 pounds. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't have that kind of strength that a man has. So you have to learn some techniques about how you can use what you have to be able to take somebody down. And I'm not talking just physically. I'm talking physically, mentally, verbally, emotionally, ways to be able to protect yourself because hits and attacks come in all forms, yeah. all different shapes and forms. So being able to, we call it deflect, you know, evade, deflect and redirect, to be able to take that kind of energy and turn it around back into your attacker so that all of that negative energy goes into them. Mm -hmm. rather than into you. And I'm even talking, you know, confrontations with family members, um, co-workers. So you really need to get some kind of techniques that is deep down inside of you that you can just automatically will just come out whenever you need it. You don't have to hang out in a smelly dojo uh, for 18 <laughs> years the way I did. Okay. Uh, you don't have to. There are other ways of doing it. 
And yes, uh, to answer the other question, it is all over social media. I've been doing a lot of book events, um, in-person events and stuff. And uh, I'm about to do a, a, a little boost campaign coming up here soon. Um, I just, it's, it is kind of an uplifting story. There's a lot of heartache in it. There's a lot of humor in it, of course. And I take you on a ride. And I believe that this kind of strength and power is in each and every one of us. I have this book not because I want to say, hey, look at me, look at what I did. I have this book because I want to say, look at you, look at what you can achieve. If I started this journey at the age of 47, I am 66 now. I'll be 66 in a couple you, of weeks. You don't look at Cheryl, honestly. I'm not, I'm not just I, saying that, you know, you don't look at it all, my word. Well, uh, the lighting helps, you know, I, I took a course on how to look good on camera, so no, I, I work on that. not at all, <laughs> but, not at all. But, no, you look great. Thank you. And that's another little secret that they don't tell you about martial arts and the art of the ninja. Martial arts, a lot of the softer styles, it's a great anti-aging technique. It's really good because it helps you. It raises, as, as some people say, I don't really understand it, but your energy, they like raise your vibration. Um, it, it takes your energy to a whole different level. And, you know, it, it just makes you a happier, healthier, stronger person. But you can be strong and feminine and soft at the same time. So... Well, come on, ladies and gents, if you want to look as good as Cheryl as she does, uh, become a ninja. That's what I would say. I mean, is there, is there, um, before we go now, but is there uh, like a universal ninja school around the world? I mean, are we talking about, so when you did your training, I mean, was that like a, a group of, say, 10 schools across the state? Or is it just an individual school that you actually went to train? Because um, it would be very really interesting to see, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would love to do what you did. I mean, mm -hmm. it is so inspiring, but is, is that is that the way it is? Or is it very unique that only certain masters do the training? It's not a well-known art. It's a little bit more obscure. People are really interested when they think of martial arts. They want to do the high kicks. They want to do break the boards. You know, those are the things that, you know, really um, attract people. But that we don't do that in our art. We do take people down, right. but you know, it's a little bit of a softer art. We focus more on um, taking people's balance, taking them, you know, off balance, taking their weight, joint locks. We do a lot of throws. We do a lot of pins. We do a lot of joint manipulation, which really came in handy as the background in a physical therapist. If you can manipulate a joint, oh, you can lock it too and that take your attacker down that way. We don't do the fancy kicks. We do take, you know, once we get someone down, it's like we kick them in the head until we feel better. It's kind of like what we do. <laughs> <laughs> we, play with, we play with weapons. We love our weapons. <clears throat> And what I would suggest if anybody's looking for something like that, just research Ninpo Taijutsu, N-I-N-P-O-T-A-I-J-U-T-S-U. And the, the dojo that I train at, we are one of a little family of like five dojos, five schools across the country. There was us in Denver. There's one um, in, I think it used to be in Nevada, in Nevada, now it's somewhere in Texas, um, I can't remember where. And then there's like two or three in like the LA area or, or, or California. So it's a very small federation, but we do have a small federation. Interestingly enough, ladies, if uh, anybody is in Germany, uh, there is a lady from um, the LA dojo who teaches Nimpo Taijutsu in Germany. I can't remember where is she? What part? Oh, it's not Frankfurt. I think she's in Berlin, right. but she teaches something called pretty deadly self-defense. So Susie, if you're listening to this, I'm plugging <laughs> you. Um, and I do believe she does do some things online and she has a training program where she teaches some of her former students how to become instructors. So it's pretty deadly self-defense. Her name is Susie, I think it's Kolich. K-O-L-I-C-H, but just look up Pretty Deadly Self-Defense and you'll find Susie and tell her Cheryl says hello. Oh, no, Do you know, so if Susie, if you're out there or if your sensei, uh, Cheryl, wants to come on and do a podcast with me and talk about this subject, because I think it's very good for well-being and health. Um, so there is my invitation. If you want to come on, you're more than welcome to have a little chat about it. And um, before we go, Cheryl, where are you 
on social media. I'm sure you're everywhere, but are you on the LinkedIn's, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, all those places? <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> yep, yep, I am on the LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm not real active on that. You know, baby boomer brain. There's only so much social social media you can learn at yes. one time. Uh huh. <laughs> um, I am on Twitter. Actually, I've figured Twitter out. All right. And okay. I, yeah, I'm pretty active on Twitter and uh, YouTube. I've got a YouTube channel. There aren't a lot of subscribers yet, but you will, uh, you will. I'm sure. We'll put I the know. links in for all of that before uh, before the podcast Excellent. is uh, released. Yes, and and uh, and I do have a podcast of my own. Yes, you do. One uh, promoted. Because nobody wants it to listen is. to me, so you might as well promote yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they'll want to listen to you. I'm going to have you on the show if you agree to be on All the right, Feminine Project. Of I course. think you're strong enough and you can handle <laughs> the pressure. Um, so it's called the Feminine Project Podcast, and it's loosely based on my experience as a martial artist. And I, I do mean loosely. Uh, but it's about uh, overcoming obstacles, personal empowerment, restoring human dignity, one person at a time, <laughs> finding your voice, standing your ground, alternative health and healing, living well and looking good because living well and looking good is the best revenge. And, and you're doing it, Cheryl. My word, you are doing it. Um, Thank you. So thanks so much. I'm going to say to uh, Cheryl, as the Europeans might say, you love but I'll mm -hmm. say I love, because we all love mm -hmm. Cheryl. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today on the Wellbeing Career Podcast. Once it's released, and once it's been approved by Cheryl, because Cheryl does the approval on this show, um, we'll release it on uh, all the social media uh, platforms. So thanks very much, Cheryl, for joining me today on the uh, podcast. Oh, David, thank you so much for having me on. I have just loved our conversation. I love your sense of humor, and I really appreciate being on the show. No, my, I think you're the only one that likes my sense of humor, but thanks so much, anyway. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>